Hey, stats people, what's up? We are starting chapter 10, and that's more hypothesis tests. Surprise, surprise. Um, but this time we're doing differences um, in proportions or differences in means. So, today we're going to focus on proportions, differences of propor proportions, and we're going to look at the sampling distribution of difference of proportions, and we're going to talk about how to create a confidence interval for difference of proportions, okay? So most of the stuff is really, really, really similar. Um, the general setup is the same. <clears throat> it's just the little details that change. Um, okay, so why would we care about differences in proportions? Well, maybe you're not testing a claim that the true proportion of yellow M&Ms is 0.2, maybe you're checking, is the proportion of yellow M&Ms the same as the proportion of red M&Ms? Or is it greater than the proportion of red M&Ms? So that would be an example. Obviously, there's a lot more examples, but we're two, comparing two different um, samples and seeing if the populations are in fact the same or not. Um, so that's why we're doing it. And realistically, if you're thinking about companies or like a big company trying to hire out um, and they want to compare two different um, employees or something, um, they could look at the difference between the two and maybe their um, amount of work or something and you want to just compare um, the two and see which one's better to go with. And so you would do something like a comparison test. Ah. Experiments are also good examples because usually you have a before and after, right? You have the before the treatment and then after the treatment, and you want to compare those two results and see if the results, uh, the variation in the results is due just to chance or did your treatment actually do something? Also, much more practical reason. Okay, so the next question is, what does the sampling distribution look like if you're looking at differences instead of just one single uh, statistic? So, um, in several chapters ago, I don't remember which chapter, but several chapters ago, I'll look that up for you. Hold on. 6.2 if you need a reminder. Um, so you've got two different distributions because you have two different statistics. You have sample one, sample two, statistic one, statistic two, um, and basically you want to check both samples for being um, for following all of the conditions that you need. So normal, independent, and random. You need to check for both samples now. <laughs> um, but first, let's look at what each of those distributions would look like. So if those conditions are met, then the distribution of P1 hat is going to look like the following. So the sampling distribution of P hat 1 um, has a mean of the true proportion, um, so P1, and then the standard deviation is the square root of P1 minus times 1 minus P1 all over n. N1, we'll say N1, is the number of um, your sample size of the first sample. Um, so that's the sampling distribution of p hat 1. And then we could do the exact same thing for p hat 2 as long as the conditions are met. Um, so it'll look exactly the same except with p2s instead of an n2s instead of uh, p1s because it's for the second sample and the second population. Okay, so if we want to compare them, we need to create a distribution that is p1 minus p2, um, the sampling distribution of p hat 1 minus p hat 2. And um, the way you do that is the same way we combined distributions in uh, 6.2. Um, and so your mean is going to be P1 minus P2. And then your standard deviation, I'll show you. I'm going to write it down just so you don't forget. Okay, so remember how in 6.2 when you combine two distributions, their standard deviation, you can add their variances together. Um, when you make your new distribution. So my sigma of p hat 1 minus p hat 2 um, is going to be the standard deviation of p 
hat 1 plus standard deviation of p hat 2. And remember, you can only add the variances, and so to get the square root, you need to take the square root of that. Okay, so that's the general form, but when you have standard deviations that look like that and like that, then the formula gets kind of nasty. <laughs> Sorry. Luckily, though, it's on the formula packet. Yay! But the other nice thing is that the square root and the square cancel out. So you end up with a standard deviation of your sampling distribution that looks like this. P1 times 1 minus P1 over N1 plus P2 times 1 minus P2 over N2, and then take the square root of that. So that is the standard deviation of your sampling distribution of P hat 1 minus P hat 2, and the mean of that is P1 minus P2. Whew! Okay, nifty. So then we can go on to making a confidence interval. Whoop, whoop. Okay, confidence intervals, same as they've always been. Your statistic plus or minus your critical value, z or t, star, uh, times the standard deviation of the statistic. Okay, Same thing we've always been doing, except this time now, your statistic is not p hat, but it is p hat 1 minus p hat 2. And your critical value, you figure out exactly the same way as we did before. Standard deviation is this nasty 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 looking thing but it's okay don't worry about it <laughs> okay two things to note one it's z star because it's proportions and we always use z with proportions the only time we use t is when we're dealing with means and we don't know sigma okay so z star always with proportions and then our standard deviation the thing to remember about that is that that is true if we have P1 and P2. We don't usually know what P1 and P2 are if we're making a confidence interval for them, right? So sometimes we replace P1 and P2 with P hat 1 and P hat 2, and that's okay, not a problem. All right, so there you have it, confidence intervals for differences of proportions. Um, so what conditions do you need? Same ones as always. Number one, random. But you got to check both samples now. Are both samples random? Um, same thing with normality. Are both samples approximately normal? Uh, sampling distributions, are they approximately normal? And last but not least, are both samples approximately independent? Or were the samples drawn independent or if you are sampling without replacement, then you have to do the 10% rule. So we'll write those out for you. So random, was each sample taken randomly? Normal is p hat 1 times n1 and 1 minus p hat 1 times n1 greater than or equal to 10. Same thing for the second sample, p hat 2 times n2 and 1 minus p hat 2 times n2. Both have to be greater than or equal to 10. And for independent, either um, you're sampling without replacement and both have to, oh, hello, Hi. have to be bigger than, smaller than 10% of the population, or each observation is independent. Say hi, Bethany. Hi, Bethany. What up? Hi. All right, so let's do an example. Um, say we're back to the cat example. And remember the last one was about, um, what the true proportion of funny cat pictures was on Google Images. And this time we're comparing Google to Yahoo, which one has a better um, set of funny cat pictures. So, <clears throat> say we took two different samples, uh, two different random samples. Um, ooh, I didn't say that. <clears throat> Make sure they're random. Okay, so say we took two random samples of size N from Google one from Google and one from uh, Yahoo. The number of pictures you laughed at on Google was 45 out of 50, and the ones that you laughed at on Yahoo were 37 out of 50. So you want to know, is this enough statistical evidence to say that Google has better cat pictures? Um, the one on the left was from Google, the one on the right was from Yahoo, by the way. I'm sure you could probably find both on each, but I just picked them randomly. Um, okay, so it says use a four-step process to build and interpret a 90% confidence interval on how many funny cat pictures there are online. 
All right, so state. You got to state your parameters and what they are and what you're going to do. Um, so in this case, we are going to do a 90% Z interval for the difference in proportions, PG minus PY, of funny cat pictures on Google versus Yahoo, where um, PG is the true proportion of funny cat pictures on Google and PY is the same but for Yahoo. Okay. Um, planning, we have to check all of our same conditions, but we have to do it for both of the samples. One, were both of the samples random? Yes, because I told you they were normal. Um, so we have to check and be sure n times p and n times 1 minus p are both greater than or equal to 10. So let's look at our Yahoo info first. We've got n times p hat. Remember p hat. Ideally we'd use p but we don't have p so we're just using p hat. Um, and that's okay with proportions. Not so okay with means, but it's okay with proportions. Um, <clears throat> so you get 37 for the first one, and you get 13 for the second one, both that are greater than or equal to 10. Yay! So that checks out. But we also have to check it for Google. Sadly for Google, the first one checks out is 45, uh, but the second one, n times 1 minus p, is not. It is 5, and that is less than or equal to 10. So that is a concern. So just make sure you state something like that, um, but do the test anyway. Something like one of these conditions is not met, so even though, I'll con even though I will continue with the test, uh, be cautious when using the results. Something along those lines. And lastly is independence, and the trials are not independent. Um, so we have to check the n is less than or equal to 10% of the population. Um, but I think we can safely assume that there are more than 50, um, 500 images of cats because people are obsessed with their cats um, <laughs> on Google and on Yahoo. All right, do. We want to set up our confidence interval. Statistic plus or minus critical value times standard deviation of st the statistic. So in this case, because we're testing the difference between Google and Yahoo, um, I have my statistic is the p hat of Google minus the p hat of Yahoo, plus or minus my z value, which I get from my z table, corresponding to the 90% confidence level, which is 5% below, right, 5% here, 5% here. Uh, gives me 90% in between. So I need to find this z star. And standard deviation of the statistic is that really nasty thing from earlier, square root of p1 times 1 minus p1 over n. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, check your packet so you don't have to memorize it. Okay, at this point we should probably actually calculate p hat g and uh, p hat y. So p hat g was that 45 out of 50, and p hat y was uh, 37 out of 50. All right, so let's plug all those numbers in. Turns out that my z star for a 90% confidence interval is approximately 1.645. So I'm going to plug that in as well, nice and neatly, not chicken scratchy. <laughs> so here's the setup for the confidence interval. Um, I would highly recommend writing down the, the formula, the variables, and like the numbers plugged in, but don't actually plug all of these individual things into your calculator because there's, surprise, a test on the calculator that does everything for you. So I'll show you that so you don't have to actually plug everything in. All right, so you go to your stat tests, then you want to find the two proportion Z interval, which I think is far down the list. See how this says two proportion z interval? That's the one you want. And then you plug in your x1, which was uh, your go so your first one, Google, your n1, which is your sample size, x2, which is 37, and then your sample size 50, confidence levels 90, and then calculate. All right, so there's my confidence interval for difference, um, and you want to conclude in context. A strong conclusion is going to have your context and your confidence level and interval, but also says which one's better than which. 